when do I know this is somebody that I should be messaging and what should that first message look like when I send it to them on LinkedIn? Great question. We're looking for a reason to, to send a message and what the message should be so that they're like, yeah, I'm fine with responding to that. Context is what we need. So if I have a reason to speak to this person, then it will be accepted. This is where content can be so powerful because it's like the easiest way to do it is if someone writes a comment, comment on your content, or this is why polls are crazy powerful for leads, like one of the best lead sources. Richard Moore, LinkedIn sales consultant and content creation expert joins the show here today. Richard Moore, welcome. Hey man, it's so nice to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is overdue, <laughs> about time he thought connected <laughs> properly. Yeah, I mean, when I first started on LinkedIn, started getting active on LinkedIn, you were one of the names that started popping up time after time after time again. So it's really an honor to get a chance to sit here and chat and get some insider secrets. So thanks for being here. Thank you. No, thank you. It really means a lot to me. It's, uh, it's There's some really amazing connections along the way. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And that's part of the magic of social media in general. And, and frankly, one of the reasons I love LinkedIn, I find that the relationships that I'm building on LinkedIn are, are deeper than on other platforms. Have you noticed that as well, Rich? I do. I think what's happened is that we've had social platforms, you know, Facebook and Instagram and so on. And, and what happened if, if you go back 2018, when this really started beginning this social side of, of LinkedIn, I do feel that people didn't want to spoil it. And so they wanted to kind of do a better job. But then you've got the context as well of just a, a might more professionalism. And that's been carried through. And I, I love it. People are just a bit more serious. And as a result, sure, they'll always be the odd troll. But in the main, you've got people who are more supportive and collaborative. And, and uh, I prefer being here than anyone else. Uh, absolutely, without question. Yeah, and I'd say that you made the right decision because it's working for you. And when I think of platforms to actually meet professionals, to sell professionals, I think LinkedIn. I don't think Instagram, mm -hmm. they're definitely not thinking TikTok, not to say that they mm -hmm. don't have a place, but LinkedIn is the place to connect with professional buyers. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's what I want to talk to you about here today. I want to, I want to kind of go back in time first, Rich, to talk about why you actually started in this LinkedIn sales consulting, because you had a great corporate style job. Why leave that? Why turn after hours entrepreneur and build your own thing? What, what yeah, um, yeah, it's not like a classic rags to riches thing. Uh, you know, people are like, so where's the bit where you're like, you know, you are homeless or on a, on your sofas <laughs> on the sofa somewhere. None of that, unfortunately. So, I did really well. I was doing really well in the cor in the corporate space. I did 10 years in the city and ultimately was a sales director. Uh, and around 2013, um, I pivoted out uh, for a number of like really personal reasons. So my, my daughter was born and uh, had no esophagus. So she had to have surgery right away. My mum died the same year, like really bad stuff happening. And so it meant that I had to like well, it didn't have to, but it made, it gave me the right kind of perspective. So there was a lot of like, what am I doing here? Spending mm. 60, sometimes 80 hour weeks in, in doing this job when it's nice and I get well looked after in that, but I'm, I'm not kind of spending it with the people that, that really matter to me. So yes. making that pivot was, was really important. And um, my marvelous wife was like, you realize you can do that kind of thing. You can do it is allowed, but because I'd been conditioned all my upbringing that success was wearing a suit, working in an office in London, but in fact, there was another way of doing it. So it's interesting because the first few years um, were doing what I'm doing now, but through Facebook. And so I got my first yeah. online, because I was doing a little offline work to start with, but online gigs were through Facebook. And so I was building my brand there, sharing content like I do now. Let's say it's slightly more polished nowadays than what it was, but I was sharing ideas and getting into conversations with people. And, and that was converting to people saying, yeah, I'd really love it if you could help me. And, and that was where I was getting my first clients. Instagram followed a couple of years later. And then 2018, March 2018, I was like, in fact, it was mid late 2017. I remember calling it and saying, there's something going on on LinkedIn. Like it's really starting to turn now. Like, like it's becoming not this online Rolodex of resumes. It's like, you know, August, 2017 is when they flicked the switch on for video. And I was like, it's just popping. Like 
I remember saying like it's gonna go and I remember like in 2018 going I've just got to shift over there because I was doing great with Facebook but as we've already said you know the context was already is naturally there with right. with LinkedIn for business so that's where it will happen so quite a, an interesting decade I've had uh, and I never thought 10 years ago I'd be what, what, doing this look, look it's a Tuesday afternoon and I'm being interviewed by someone <laughs> uh, and a Tuesday afternoon 10 years ago I was in a very different place yeah yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, having kids on myself really kind of forced me to reassess where my life is going, where my life is heading. I wish I could have back up 10 years before having a kid so I could really yeah. focus down there. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you get to where you want to get as long as you recognize that the path that you're on is is not the correct one and that you want to shift and certainly helps it doesn't hurt yeah. having spousal support. I'll tell you what, oh, it, certainly absolutely. it may, makes it all very good when you know that someone backs you. 100%. Well, it sounds like you pretty early on, Richard, re recognized that social media needs to be a major part of your acquisition strategy. How am I going to find new clients? How am I going to educate new clients? Mm. Was it immediately obvious to you that social media was the path to get there? Or did you or did you start with the cold calling, the opening up the Rolodex and get to social media eventually? How did you get started in social? That's a really good question for someone like me, because my background was the cold calling world, my very first job. And then yep. the first few years of my corporate life was approaching people cold and selling them, you know, and, and having to navigate that whole process. Uh, and this is high ticket selling in corporate is tough. You have to be really resilient and that. And I knew the space well, I was good at it, but um, there was something really amazing about this idea of warming an audience first. And so mm. the answer is I did both. I knew that if I could have a voice that drew an audience, that would really help me. But what I learned rapidly was that if you have an entitled approach led by actually what is arrogance, where you're like, hey, I do this thing, get in touch if you want help, you realize that that's not the way, that's not real empathy for what a buyer is keen on, that, that you need to really tune into what they're experiencing, their emotional state when they observe your content and warn them a little bit more patiently than that. But I was coupling this approach of like learning that with, I had a rule which was every day, 20 new people, typically with the context of, you know, they'd connected with my content or they'd like to post or whatever it might be, but 20 new people I'd start new conversations with. So I was playing 20 games of chess every day, plus the carryover from the previous day. And I, you know, in like, that's my Netflix. I, I love doing that. Kind of, it was kind of fun, it's sport, and I enjoy the process of romancing someone through that. And so I'm really, I suppose I'm fortunate in a way that my, my, career was solely focused on the stuff that you really need to be able to be effective at converting people mm. through dms and, and and in turn through social um i'd done my whole my whole career being on that so it was really interesting to go from something akin to a cold approach but i was approaching people because you know they were kind of in orbit around me and that's evolved to where we are today which is zero outreach uh, all inbound well, I love the idea of warm leads because it, it makes your job so much easier when the people that you're speaking to and potentially selling to already understand what it is you do. They already okay. they see you showing up on social media. They see the social proof. They see the testimonials. It makes mm -hmm. all the difference. So the way that we're going to warm up these leads is with our content itself. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm a consultant, I'm really trying to break through on social media. I'm trying to break through the noise. What type of content should I be making to really warm up my audience? What type of content should I make? Yeah, it's a good question because you've got to think about the, the problem is people think, well, if I just make a, have a commentary on the industry I'm in or the stuff I do, that would be fine. But what you're doing there is you're just contributing to a conversation that already exists. Hmm. It's far better hmm. to have a bit of a deeper think about not just what things you can talk about, but who it is that your ideal buyers are gonna want you to be. Now, I've gotta be careful here because I'm not suggesting we're inauthentic. We wanna make sure we are ourselves, but we wanna be our best selves because what we're doing, for instance, in video or even through text is we're projecting onto an audience a vibe of what it would be like to work with us. So one of the reasons I do a live show every week uh, and possibly a reason why you do a podcast, for instance, is it gives people a really good sense of the you if you write text and put up images, that's all well and good, but they get a real vibe of what Mark's like or what Richard's like. So 
making sure that you're bringing some consistency and frequency to the week really helps. But in terms of specifically what really moves the needle, what I call a reframe post is really crucial. And the idea of a reframe post is it reframes, which is a fr framing is a term to represent a perspective, um, the way an audience views something. So for instance, if I'm a consultant selling, I don't know, services for podcasts, what are the myths or mainstream beliefs that my audience of potential buyers hold and believe to be true that in fact aren't quite right? And challenging those naturally sets you aside from the herd and by default will make people see you in an elevated role. So what I'm mapping back from actually and this is how I need to test whether or not this is going to be a post worth sending or not, uh, is am I going to generate this feeling? Because it is a feeling of no wonder. I, no wonder I wasn't getting the results I wanted because I wasn't doing that thing that Rich has just mentioned. And you, the indicator that you've, or the signifier that you've had success with this post is that you get these messages saying, I just had to say, I never looked at it that way before. So what you can do is say, like, what are the beliefs everyone has? What are the common feelings about the space I'm in? And you don't challenge it for the sake of it, but you're like, well, where do I believe they're not quite right? So if I can give it a perfect example, right? A couple of months ago, I did a post that was um, that said it's wrong to lead with value. And so naturally, everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> this is sacrilege, because the whole thing at the moment in content is you should be leading with value It's value first. But my point was, sure, but if you think about it, when you approach someone cold, because the context of the post within it was, if you're going to someone cold, when you lead with value, there's no context to, to your value. Like there's no, there's, they've not asked for your value. You're a stranger. When someone loves you and thinks you're awesome and, and it follows your content, well, of course they love your value. And that's why it doesn't work when you approach someone cold with your templated message, it says, hey, there's all this great free value I know you'd love. It's my free webinar and my free ebook and my free this and my free, free that. It's a massive amount of arrogance that that person will want it. That value is right, but it's out of process. You need to lead with the connection first. You need to let that person say, do you know what? I really like this guy's content. I really, it really vibes with me. And then when they get in touch and share cues that suggest that, well, now giving them value is more appropriate. So the, the problem people have is they, they start too early with the value. And so I was just kind of doing things like that. It makes people go, that's a really good point. No wonder I wasn't getting the results. And of course, one of the biggest leverage points in persuasion technique is human curiosity. So by creating this, what happens is people are like, wow, that's a different way of looking at it. What's the first thing they do? Who is this Richard guy? And they click on the link and there I am. And 95% of them aren't relevant, but the 5% who are like, hang on, I'm a consultant. That is the frustration I have in fact, that I can't convert for my content. Maybe I should check out more. And guess whose content LinkedIn then serves to them again, mine. And so it's just, it's, like, it's just about leveraging curiosity, a very long patient play, but, but reframe posts position you as that thought leader that has an exceptional or, or, or unique view on things. And that naturally makes people see you as a higher thinker, which is always, always good. I like the idea of the reframe post, Rich. What it sounds like to me is that's a way of creating a conversation, creating a fresh conversation. I really like this yeah. concept of I'm not just contributing to the conversation that millions of people are already having. I'm creating a new conversation. I'm, yeah. it, it also reminds me of something that Evan Carmichael said to me on the show was make a bold statement, a bold mm. statement that piques someone's curiosity, that, that perks their ears back. The idea, the idea of don't lead with value is very interesting because that's something that we're all told to do with social media. Yeah, and, I, and he's right. You know, you, that slightly more polarizing, strident view, essentially, if you have a, an opinion, then deliver it, means mm. that you're rather than sitting in the middle, making everyone go, yeah, he's all right. It's like, some people are like, I don't agree, man. And then you got other people going, oh, wow, I really agree. This guy's like me. And they're leaning in with receptivity that much more. So I totally subscribe yeah. to that approach. 
when you when you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. Is is what ends up what ends up, what ends yeah. up happening. The, I mean, and the other thing I think that's really important here too. But I really want to talk about LinkedIn profiles a little bit because I think it's really important that you have a strong LinkedIn profile. I think that plays an important part. I want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about posts and content though. You know, you talk about this reframe post, but you know. To me, it seems like we need to be offering different types of posts based on the relationship we have with this viewer on our page, right? Because, yeah. for example, when one of your Monday Q&As comes up, I know exactly who Rich is. I've been seeing it week after week after week, very consistent. Yeah. Um, do you feel like it's important to have different types of posts to facilitate these relationships, try to warm up relationships based on where they're at in the cycle? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. You've got to have like that evergreen post. Uh, you can't assume everyone's been following you for two years. <laughs> and so, and what's interesting is that there's this balance of considerations. Like, am I speaking simultaneously, not only to brand new people, because the second connections are so critically important. These are the people, these are the new seeds in the ground, if you like. Then there's the ones who are already in your space that they need to have reinforcement that you're their dude that knows this stuff. But what people overlook is you also have to reinforce and crystallize that you're the guy to existing clients as well. Mm -hmm. The people who are already in your community and in your space who've bought something, they need to be like, there's my guy. God, I love this stuff. And that, no, you know what? It really validates the decision I made last week to buy his thing. I, it just removes any buyer's remorse. So it's a difficult balance. And I think what, what we need to always be doing is saying like, am I speaking in a way that, that invites in new conversation from fresh people? But am I also not leaving on the table the people I already work with? So it's always a difficult thing to do. And so, but, but at the same time, we also need to have a level of sophistication about the commentary we're putting into content because we don't, again, we don't want to a, appeal to all people. We want to appeal to a certain level of, um, of, of person who's going to work with me. So for example, if I do really basic content about basic stuff in LinkedIn marketing, I'm going to approach the basic crowd that is looking for entry level work with me. And then, and I will turn off the more advanced champions who may well be spending premium to get the very top level knowledge. So by being a bit more intellectually driven or a bit more um, advanced in the tips, I may be turning off some of the entry level start people, but I'm hitting the people higher up. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make is they're all like too basic and then they want premium clients. So. A lot of things to hold balls to juggle in the air at the same time, I suppose. Yeah, well, it is. It is because there's so many different types of content. There's so many different platforms yeah. that we can be on. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn definitely has some magic, especially when it comes to video. Like you said, they were a little bit late yeah. to the video game. Now they're moving more towards the social creator type of platform. You know, they just announced new type of types of profiles that you can have on LinkedIn. Tell me your take on that, Richard. Are you excited about new profiles? Do you think it's just not not anything crazy? What are your thoughts on the new LinkedIn profiles? I, I think it, I think it can be good uh, for the next. It's interesting to see how it goes. There's a world in which two years from now, marketers have spoiled it. <laughs> and the C-suite, the C-suite have run for the hills because, oh, God, it's, it feels like Facebook again. Mm. And so it's very difficult to know. Um, but I think I think Microsoft now has its social platform <laughs> in that in the set in the sense that it has, you know, stories here. It has amazing features in creator mode. I love the idea that when I go live, my banner on my profile will become the live stream. I mean, that is epic. But I yeah. do think that. I don't, I think that some people are overthinking how it's going to like change the world for them. It, it will help a bit. Uh, you'll probably get an algorithmic nudge because you're participating. Uh, and I, I presume that we'll, it will add to this wonderful direction LinkedIn's going in, which is to move from having users to having communities. And I know that sounds cute, but like, it's a really important thing before you had people who are connected and now you have real networks where people are like i know that person i've had a talk with them or i've met them at a business conference or i've collaborated with them or something like that really good connections are lubricated as a result of content i believe and conversation mm -hmm. starting so it can only be good but i 
there's a little worry I have that in a couple of years from now, what was a really exciting proposition a couple of years back with all the top people with basically no content, uh, all the top people in business here with almost no content going out becomes this maelstrom of of content borrowed from other platforms that loses the context of business. And I'm the first person to put my hand up and say, I'm aware that content in business is and should evolve to be more entertaining perhaps or whatever, but it could be that we lose the slightly more um, conservative minded decision makers, which may or may not be a good thing because ultimately it's the people who hold the purse strings that ultimately sign the checks. If marketers leverage LinkedIn to sell to marketers, then great, but it may mean that we scare off a, a cohort of decision makers who can help us in the business, in the, the more B2B side, if you like. It's a, it's a difficult one because yeah. at, simultaneously to that commentary, we've got this whole, um, the whole business world evolving anyway, because today's 20 year olds are, are tomorrow's decision makers, you know, and so it'd be interesting to see where this goes. I'm really fascinated. Like, honestly, life, life moves fast on social, as you know, in the last two to three years, so much has changed. 2023, 24, it'll be very interesting to see how LinkedIn's performing then. Well, if there's one thing that we've seen time and time again, is that platforms are going to continue to change. They're going to continue to evolve. And one of the things that you said here, Rich, that I absolutely love is that if you try out this new this new formula, this new feature, you might get an algorithmic nudge. I like the way you put that because that is yeah. definitely something that we know is true. If you're trying that new feature, that new format, that new type of post, the platform is going to reward you. They want yeah. to see more data. It, it helps you. It helps them. Um, so what I'd like for everyone to do, all you after hours entrepreneurs out there is DM Mark Savant, on LinkedIn and let me know if you've tried out the new creator uh, fr framework for your for your LinkedIn profile. I want to know. DM Mark Savant on LinkedIn. I want to know. I want to share it with Rich here as well. DM you know, DM Rich too. We want to fill up his his DMs, right? So <laughs> yeah. Speaking of DMs, Rich, before we get into the over under section of the show, mm -hmm. I, I want to know a little bit more about how you handle moving from warm lead to okay we're dming because i gotta be honest <clears throat> i get dm'd so much crap all the time it has no shot of ever landing when do i know this is somebody that i should be messaging and what should that first message look like when i send it to them on linkedin great question and and by the way all of those dms that are irritating are super powerful for two reasons i must add this Firstly, they're powerful because they condition everyone who gets them, so everyone, that this is irritating stuff, ignore it. So anything opposite is good. And mm. secondly, it tells you right there what not to do. If anyone listening is doing those kind of messages but wouldn't respond to them themselves, oh. that says you view your audience and set of buyers in on a lower plane than you which is a mm. terrible mindset to have they're not inferior to you they're just as intelligent and they will see these messages and go i'm not responding to that so if you wouldn't then it's crazy to send them out and what we're looking for just to answer your question here is we're looking for a reason to to send a message and what the message should be so that they're like yeah i'm fine with responding to that context is what we need so if i have a reason to speak to this person then it will be accepted just because we're relevant in that i don't know we went to the same university or it are both in florida it's not really good enough because that, that's kind of a bit that's a bit like on the top level so this is where content can be so powerful because if like the easiest way to do it is if someone writes a comment comment on your content or well, this is why polls are crazy powerful for leads like one of the best lead sources because so when someone votes on your poll that says you know as a question if it says what's the thing that you're struggling with most on linkedin and one of the options is conversion from my content well look i've got 162 people there who've gone i have a problem with this thing 
What do you think my message mm. could be related to? Not, hey, I want to add like-minded people to my network, which is boring and the same as everyone else. I can say, Mark, just wanted to say thank you so much for voting on my poll today. How are you doing? And because we have context, the commonality of the poll, of course you're going to respond because you did that first step. You're actually, you're like, yeah, I did. I voted on your poll. Nice to meet you. Just out of interest, what made you choose that option? Or, you know, bring some herd mentality so he feels permission to share. So I'll say something like, um, you know, it's interesting. So many people love that. Or I could even get the results. 54% actually voted the same as you. Just out of interest, what was it that made you that made you decide to vote that? A third won't bother responding because only half people are on LinkedIn a month anyway. A third of them might be giving you some lukewarm thing like, I don't know, it's just something I just wanted to see what the results are. And then there might be a third who are like, just like, I don't get anywhere with my content. Like I post all the time and, and that is the next step. The next step's really simple. I'm looking for one of two cues. If the cue is either a compliment in a message, Richard, I just think you're awesome. I love your stuff. It's really inspiring. I just, I learned so much from you about conversion on LinkedIn. Well, there's a cue that I can ask them if they want to take things further or a struggle, a compliment or a struggle because no one shares a struggle unless they want it fixed, right? So when they are in the DMs, we've done this poll approach I've, I've mentioned, for instance, and they're like, do you know what it is? I just don't know how I, I meant to get people to step forward. I, I can't get any kind of results from them. That cue is them saying, like, if you could help, that'd be awesome. If you're nervous, go for a second cue. But unless you get the compliment or the or the struggle, you're not ready to pivot to an ask yet. So you mm. don't you don't try and pivot to a hey, well, you know what? I know I can help. Would you like to grab a call or would you like to explore this further? until you've earned the right to do so. Because technically someone could buy your product, it doesn't mean you should sell them it. Yeah. That's what people hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. So what you want to do is, is set it up so that you only approach them with the beginning of a sell when they're giving you the cue or the sign that either compliment, they see you as the expert and wanna learn from you, or struggle, they see you as someone who might be able to help them. Otherwise, just keep going. And, and sometimes you don't get a win, do you? Sometimes it's not a deal, but it's still a win because look, I've just made a great connection and that person might refer me or he might cheerlead my next piece of content. So it's, it's worth remembering that every individual you connect with has a network. And right. despite not getting a deal from everyone, they still might be someone they add to your network and, and brings you great results in the future. So, so it's, that's kind of your super short <laughs> uh, uh, process through the DMs to, to make sure you're not pressuring people in the wrong way. Well, the, you know, no doesn't mean never. It just means not now, right? Precisely. So treating everyone with respect is, is certainly a big deal. But I love okay. this idea of leveraging the polls because now you know the exact pain point that this person has. And, and honestly, not use them. absolutely. Oh, it's, it's absolutely insane. Plus the, the, the reach that I find you get on polls is, is massive. I get way more reach on polls, way more engagement conversation. Polls are definitely, mm. I'm trying to get to this rhythm of at least one poll a week on LinkedIn, Yeah, uh, run it for seven days. And it, it's, it's about just, time. I mean, I mean, they've been languishing at the bottom in terms of distribution, <laughs> polls and live stream. LinkedIn was like, nah, and it's like, come on, I get some market research. But now they're like, they have soared uh, the, uh, lately. Just there's so much engagement. And so, yeah, you can't miss with, when you yeah, do polls I, right. And there's a lot of things on LinkedIn that you can do on LinkedIn. I think a lot of people don't even know, like stories mm. and, you know, mm. polls and, and all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, mm. So this is a great, great kind of entryway. Of course, Richard Moore, the Richard Moore dot com, <laughs> the Richard Moore dot com. You can find out and get more in-depth LinkedIn sales tips before I let you go, though, Rich. We got to hit the wrap, uh, the, the wrap. Fire. We got to hit the over under over under. And I've got some tough ones for you. Are you ready? I've never done this before, so I'm, I'm pumped. Let's try it. <laughs> it's going to it's going to be good. I'm going to start it off with an easy one. Overrated, cool. underrated Buckingham Palace. Do I have a time limit? Um, uh, uh, there's no middle ground here, Mark. It's unfair. I think, I think a little bit, a 
tiny bit underrated. There's a spectrum here, man. It's slightly underrated. Like, you know, it's it's a it's a great place. I think it could be leveraged more, let's say. <laughs> okay, okay. I could dig, dig it. That's okay. hard. Go on. <laughs> you got it. You got to keep it difficult. Here's another one. Uh, auto responders in your DMs. Overrated, underrated? Overrated. Do you want me to explain? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I think that they are overrated because if you're, unless you're doing immensely high volume sales, like crazy, like Netflix style, but if, it's funny that people want autoresponders, probably if you reduce it down through laziness when you are doing high ticket selling. High ticket selling requires exceedingly low volume, highly qualified leads. Mm. Don't use an autoresponder. Pull your finger out and engage manually because if you if you focus on a wholesome experience with it, with someone, you're much more likely to get them to go, I feel special. Here's eight grand a month. Autoresponders aren't the best way to start. And everyone here has got the time uh, for the people that will pay them high ticket. So just that's the caveat of his high ticket. Um, but but that's my world. I, I like that caveat. I like that response. It's, it's really, really intelligent. Um, overrated, underrated, having your own podcast. Underrated, but I'm, ma I'm making something of everything. Here. The reason why it's underrated but but there's a but is that it's underrated because the reach sure but the lubrication for your business in terms of a community of people who have access to your ideas and your philosophy um your reach is crazy the reason why there's a but here is because i think a vast number of people run a podcast because it's a jolly it's a nice thing to do what i call positive procrastination Positive procrastination is where you do things that feel like they're important and relevant to business, but actually don't do anything at all. Mm. Uh, a great example being, I'll read another book or I'll watch another YouTube video or I'll do another online course about the thing I do because it helps me avoid trying to close deals because like, we need money right now. So like that's positive procrastination rather than sitting and watching telly. And podcasts have the... The op it's an opportunity to achieve really spectacular things. We have mutual fri friends doing them. You were running one as well. And you can really leverage them in a neat way for wonderful opportunities. But just to sit and have interviews, it's fine if you want to do that, but you better have another channel to, to, to market as well. So I, I don't know. I think that they're underrated because not because people aren't using them, but people aren't using them in the right way, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of podcasts probably not getting the, not giving the owner of the podcast the, the, you know, the best results that they could. That's just my view. As someone who does, my podcast is just, you know, it's low key. It's not a big deal. <laughs> I, I mean, I think you, you brought up a lot of interesting points. We could do an entire show on I'm, podcasting the right way and the wrong way, for sure. I, I'm desperate for your opinion on, on, on my commentary there out of interest. Well, I mean, I would say that a lot of people go into podcasting with unrealistic expectations. They they believe right. they're going to get lots of downloads. They're going to start generating leads really quickly. But really, podcasting is, to me, not so much about lead generation and more about relationship building. Mm, you know, definitely. relationship building with other people like yourself um, or with or with with potential clients, with fans. Um, I think it's about the relationships. And one of the things that I think I've gotten wrong in my journey is I started making it more about systems rather than the relationship. So right. um, I, I think that it's, it's really important that you recognize that podcasts are relationship builders. Um, yeah. And I think being strategic and intentional, therefore, about who you interview rather than just your pals, unless that's what you want to do. I think that's the point. Like, uh, you're totally right. And like, you can really level up through collabing through your podcast with the right yeah. person that can unlock networks my equivalence being i just do a recording and, and a video online but it's the same principle if you do a collab with someone who can really you know access a, a new set of people for you that is super powerful in my opinion for sure for sure for sure all right cool i want to ask you one more rat uh overrated underrated here overrated right. underrated linkedin stories massively underrated mark massively <laughs> if anyone here 
gets anything from Instagram stories, do LinkedIn stories. I, I love it. Instagram stories was probably my second best income stream over LinkedIn post, sorry, Instagram stories over Instagram post uh, to obviously number one being link, LinkedIn content, but LinkedIn stories has crushed it. What's fascinating about them is that they seem to target a lot of second and third connections as well. So I'm scooping up huge amounts of distribution with new people. And of course, look, we're back to the context of a DM. Hey, Mark, just wanted to say thanks so much for checking out my LinkedIn story. And of course, after the time, they're like, did I? <laughs> but the yeah. point is, you can still jump in and say thanks for doing it. And like, yeah, that was really cool what you did for the same reasons that Instagram stories were the game changer, um, LinkedIn stories are now aligned with your professional profile on, on LinkedIn. Is there a I particular, is there a call to action you like to put in your stories? Swipe up. <laughs> yeah, no, a, a lot of it is like, yeah, a lot of it's swipe up to get more and you can promote a post, but sometimes it's, it's about just giving people, um, uh, a little glimpse on what's going on throughout your day. So actually the calls to action don't always need to be there, but I think that it, the problem, the problem with LinkedIn stories is it's a very clunky interface. It's really, it feels very beta. So the best way to build a story, adding calls to action, things like that, and design it right is use Instagram, download it, put it in, in LinkedIn. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the calls to action are to swipe up and you can access the latest posts, but you need to put the content in that teases that and makes people want to slide swipe up in the same way as you would well, that, with any content. And it's very smart. I like what you just said, Rich, repurposing the stories that you're using on other platforms like Instagram. You already got the content. Why oh, not right. use it? You know, why Absolutely. not use it? Absolutely. Um, and if your video is under 20 seconds, you can use a video clip there too. All right, mm. cool. Uh, final question here for you, Rich. If you had 10 seconds with yourself 10 years ago, what are you going to tell Rich? invest in bitcoin <laughs> no, i think i think i i would be like go i think the, the thing i'd say knowing i would probably be leaving work anyway is you can always go bigger than you think you can every year you think you can go bigger and bigger you could go even bigger just like there really shouldn't be any limits and um you evolve into a, a bigger company each year but you could start way further down the track because a lot of them it's all just up here so I'd invest a lot in, in going as big as I can. Um, that would be more than 10 seconds, but words to that effect. Love it. Well, Richard, thanks for stopping by the After Hours Entrepreneur and sharing your words of wisdom. Please, everyone, make sure you find Richard Moore on LinkedIn. Tell him you enjoyed him on the show and uh, make sure you get involved in his polls. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much for watching. I'm glad you enjoyed this episode. I've got several other episodes right here for you. Smash one of these videos to make sure that you don't miss out on the tips, tools, and tactics of industry experts. Let's take that side hustle full time. Smash one of these links.